All right, let's go. All right, welcome back to the Naval News segment, everybody. Today, we're going to go over Fleet Tracker. Uh, we're going to recognize the United States Naval deployments around the globe. And we, it looks like we have a couple limited deployments right now. Everybody's in port, maybe getting ready for something big. Uh, the Iwo Jima Amphibious Ready Group is coming back across the Atlantic, uh, back to Norfolk, Virginia. She had been deployed for many months off the coast of uh, Iran and Pakistan and India, supporting our operations over there in Afghanistan over the summer. And so those uh, young men or women are coming home. The Essex, uh, which relieved them, is pulled into Bahrain right now. And the Ronald Reagan and the Carl Vincent are ships passing in the night over here at the Philippine Sea. Ronald Reagan is going home to Japan after a very long deployment that we've been following for months uh, with the Iwo Jima ARG. And the Carl Vinson Carrier Strike Group is uh, is the relieving force. They're going to be operating in this vicinity for this week. We'll see if they end up in the Indian Ocean at any time. Uh, we expect the Carl Vinson to stay in the Philippine Sea and the South China Sea area, conducting uh, deployment operations and supporting uh, other exercises with other nations over the coming weeks. Uh, and we'll see how that works out. We'll see um, how it goes. All right, let's come down here. Again, our total Navy battle force is 296 ships. That is unchanged. There's only 86 ships total underway right now. Only 66 of those are in fleets. The other 20 are independent steaming operations, including submarines, that we do not discuss the location of here on this channel. All right, let's begin in the Philippine Sea over there. We got Ronald Reagan and Carl Vinson. Like I said, one uh, carrier group is going is beginning their deployment essentially, even though it's been a, a month now already, and uh, one's on its way home. Here we have a uh, Airman Rodriguez from Cleveland. He's observing flight operations as part of a crash salvage team on the flight deck of the aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan. So this man's been at sea for many months, uh, clearly. In a steam suit, here's some kind of firefighting protective suit in case there's ever an accident or something terrible happens on the flight deck. This man will rush in, put the fire out, and save lives. So very important job of what he's doing here. These suits, I should mention, very uncomfortably hot. Like, no matter what the weather is outside, you're always hot in these, in these firefighting ensembles. But they're designed to keep heat out, which also keeps your heat in. And so it's like wearing, you know, thermal underwear, essentially, that's, uh, that's fireproof. All right, from... Uh, the description from USNI News, by the way, that publishes this weekly, uh, the Reagan Carrier Strike Group, or CSG, and the Carl Vinson CSG are operating together in the Philippine Sea. Uh, the Japanese-based Ronald Reagan CSG is transiting south it, through the South China Sea over the past few days. According to the Navy, the CSG conducted flight operations, maritime strike operations, and anti-submarine operations, and tactical training in the South China Sea. Normal de deployment stuff. All right, uh, the, on the Ronald Reagan, uh, we have Carrier Air Wing 5, which we've talked about a lot over the past few months. Here's one of the pilots uh, mounting and exerting dominance over his F-18, as he should. Look at that. Getting in. I love this this visor he's got. This is like a heads-up display that's right on his visor. Yeah, this is what they see is actually not public, but it's uh, it's very cool to see all the pilots wearing these now. All the F-18 Super Hornet pilots, I should say. All right, and then here are all the uh, the flight wings that are attached to the carrier flight uh, air wing, rather. Here's cruiser Shiloh, uh, underway with the Ronald Reagan. You can see that she has a lot of rust running down her discharge ports. That's because she's been operational for a long time. Whenever she pulls back into dry dock, uh, or even if they just go pier side, they'll uh, clean her right back up, get her ship shape, if you know what I mean. Uh, the guided missile destroyer USS Halsey steams next to Military Sealift Command Replenishment Ship, or USNS, John Lenthal. That's a TAO-189 replenishment ship. These replenishment ships, by the way, they don't really get a break. They're always at sea, it seems. You know, the only time they pull into port is to replenish themselves uh, with stores and oil and whatever stock. And then they go right back out to sea again to, to support the fleet. So a big tip of the hat to everybody that works very hard at US on the USNS ships. They don't get enough credit because a lot of them are not active duty. They're merchant Marines essentially, and they spend their life at sea. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting lifestyle. If you think you'd be interested in something like that, look up how to get into the merchant Marines. Uh, here we have sailors on board the Nimitz aircraft carrier, Carl Vincent manned the rails in preparation for a passing honors for their Japanese maritime self-defense force uh, Marasim, uh, destroyer called JS uh, Ikazuki. 
The DD-107 is a Congo-class guided missile destroyer. Also, JS uh, Chokai, DDG-176. So there's two ships total there. Two Japanese ships going to pass. So something about manning the rails. This is a long-held naval tradition and honors that ships passing, you know, acknowledge each other, salute the crews, man the rails, and salute each other. Sometimes they uh, will blow the horn. I think it's like three times as a custom. Um, but from an enlisted point of view, this is really, this puts a crink in your day because all these sailors were obviously doing something, whether it was maintenance or training, maybe field day cleaning, uh, you, you never know. And then you got to break whatever you're doing and go man the rails for the 20, 30 minutes, however long it takes to get this all set up and then go right back to what you were doing essentially extending your workday artificially. So it's a real pain in the butt, but even as an enlisted man, you, you recognize the tradition and the honor of doing this. And uh, so that kind of makes it a little bit easier. Or at least you understand why you're doing it. But every one of these little sailors, probably not too happy that he's manning the rails at the moment. <laughs> yeah, something we did a lot. Well, not on a submarine, but in the port, uh, you do it in port as well, but it's a little bit different. Uh, in port, you'll... Uh, blow the horn as a ship passes you if it's going to sea or coming home and everyone will stand at attention as it as it passes by so even on a submarine we don't have necessarily rails we're not on the surface very often you still do yonder renders import as well all right carry our wing two with the carl vincent uh i really like this photo this uh I thought was a double exposure, which it at least is a double exposure, but uh, there's something else going on here that as a photographer, as an amateur photographer, I could not figure out. Uh, so he took a, a snapshot here as this uh, looks like an F-18 maybe coming in for a trap. And then he took another snapshot here, but then he also has a long exposure in between. So there's at least three different layers of photography going on here. And I really have to give uh, a lot of credit to the professional photographers they have in the Navy. They do things with cameras that I can't figure out as an amateur photographer. I've been into photography now for about two years and I really, uh, I've learned a lot of the tricks, but this one baffles me. I don't know how they did this one, but it's a really cool photo that I wanted to show you guys. And uh, this is a U.S. Navy photo. This is some enlisted sailor, E5, petty officer. Uh, making great art. Really good stuff. All right, cruisers. Let's talk about the cruisers that are at sea. We have Ticonderoga class cruiser Lake Champlain CG57 transiting with a Japanese uh, destroyer here. There's a Japanese destroyer off in the back. You can see that it looks very similar to our early Burke because the Congo class is essentially an early Burke um, with some minor differences. And this, of course, you can see the iconic Ticonderoga front facing. Uh, radar right there the spy one well it used to be spy one it's probably spy something else by now uh and then we've destroyer squadron one that's at sea with them is the, the five destroyers dewey O'Kane, uh michael murphy chafee and stockdale a lot of firepower right here remember the today's destroyers for the united states navy is like our battleships now so imagine five battleships sailing with uh the uh, carrier group because that is the level of firepower these arleigh burks have it's crazy, crazy strong. Okay, in the Persian Gulf, here we have a uh, Marine assigned to Bravo Company Battalion Landing Team 1-1. Probably a different way of saying that. 11th Marine uh, Expeditionary Unit Fast Ropes from an Osprey. Oh, very cool. This fast roping operation, I've seen this uh, being trained with just... Um, not, not, not a helicopter, but having a stand and the Marines would, would just fast rope down it. It looks extremely dangerous. I don't know how they do it. I've never had to do this. I wouldn't want to, to be honest with you, but uh, very cool that they're doing that. Okay. So the Essex amphibious ready group uh, with embarked 11th Marine expeditionary unit deployed August 12th and continues to operate in the Persian Gulf. That's the one I said was docked at Bahrain. And that's just an approximation. They could be at sea right now. Who knows? Uh, ARG is comprised of three ships, the Essex, the Portland, and the Pearl Harbor. And those three work together to support an amphibious operation. So you got, you know, an amphibious dock ship, uh, a transport dock, and what is the LPD? Uh, that's the transport dock. Yeah, I think there's three of them here. Okay, the 11th MEU consists of four major components, a command element, a ground combat element, an aviation combat element, and logistic support. That's everything you need to support yourself. That's one thing that is really cool about the Marine Corps is that they're a self-sustaining unit. So, you know, as long as they can get there, they can sustain their own operations until the Army shows up, the Air Force shows up. And that's really what they take a lot of pride in being able to do is they're a self-sustained corps. 
Hence the name. Uh, in the Eastern Atlantic, these are the Marines that are coming back after a very long deployment. You can see here they're doing some uh, PT, that's physical training, uh, something that I don't miss very much. But you'll notice that a lot of the physical training things that you do in the military are very kind of homoerotic a little bit. So, hey, if you're into that, you know, consider joining the, uh, the, the military. Here they're doing what seems to be the marine version of the human centipede, where they are putting their legs on the shoulders of the men behind them, which means their heads are in their crotch, uh, and doing push-ups for whatever reason. Maybe marines are just getting bored. Marines on board a ship, very dangerous. If you, if you let them get bored, they will start breaking things, like each other. So you want to keep them busy doing things like this. All right. From uh, the description, it says Marines of the 24th Marine Expeditionary uh, Unit participate in a martial arts program in the hangar. Oh, very cool. They're learning karate. Wax on and wax off. Probably more like martial arts or uh, mixed martial arts fighting is what I imagine the Marine Corps learns now because uh, MMA is, uh, is the dominant uh, sport at the moment in terms of uh, that that type of sport. Uh, having transited the Suez Canal last week, the Iwo Jima Amphibious Ready Group and the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit steamed directly through the Mediterranean without stopping and into the Eastern Atlantic. They probably sh they probably have earned a, a port visit, but they didn't get one. That's too bad. Um, the RGMEU consists of amphibious uh, group Iwo Jima, uh, the Carter Hall, which is the LSD, and then the San Antonio, which is the LPD. And just like the three ships working together in the Persian Gulf, completing the Marine Corps element that's deployed, uh, these three ships here support each other, giving them complete control of the air, sea, land, and command and logistics. You know, those four uh, parts of the uh, of really any operation, but especially Marine Corps operations. Okay, the 24th MEU is headquartered in Lejeune, North Carolina, and cons consists of a ground combat element, battalion landing team, like I just talked about. I should just read from the piece. I'm telling you guys things that are already in the piece. <laughs> All right, back to the Western Pacific, though. Um, the Queen Elizabeth has left Guam, and this is a little snapshot of their Twitter page, where they had at least a week, it might have been more than a week, in port. And so the crew's got a chance to, you know, do some scuba diving, do some sightseeing. This is all really cool. You know, being halfway around the world from where you, where you're home ported and where you live, you know, and do your daily life, you find yourself, you know, in Guam for a week and a half, um, experiencing things that you wouldn't normally see in England, like sunshine and dry weather. Okay, the UK Royal Navy Carrier Strike Group, led by HMS Queen Elizabeth R08, got underway on Monday, September 27th, that's just a few days ago, uh, having completed her maintenance and upkeep in Guam. So I'm sure she had a lot of maintenance to do because she's been deployed uh, for a long time now. This is going on probably three months, maybe, maybe even longer than that. Uh, UK Carrier Strike Group includes a Type 23 anti-submarine frigate, the Richmond, uh, in the Kent, the Type 45 guided missile destroyer, the, the Defender, which, by the way, is the only one that's seaworthy right now. They built five of these and four of them don't work. They need to get them, fix that stuff, man. Okay, HMS Diamond uh, is underway with them. Oh, that's another Type 44. Hmm. Okay, but I guess two work. Okay, Royal Auxiliary Fleet uh, Victoria Tide Spring and USS Destroyer Sullivan's is with them. This is a, That's one of our early Burks as well. Uh, and, of course, the Netherlands Everstein is with them and Submarine Artful. That's one of the, I want to say, is that Trafalgar? No, that's the new um, Astute, right, is with them. Also, the Wake Island Avengers. I got corrected by somebody in the Marine Corps, so thank you for correcting me. I called these the Wake Avengers for short last week, and apparently that is uh, a bit of um, a slap in the face. I did not mean to do that, so I'm going to correct myself this week and say Wake Island Adventures, U.S. Avengers. U.S. Marine Corps Fighter Attack Squadron. Okay, 211 are embarked with the Royal Air Force Squadron Dam Busters. So a tip of the hat to them, and uh, thanks for correcting me. You know, whenever I get stuff like that wrong, feel free to do that. All right, so that's a big shout out to everyone that's deployed right now, including uh, a lot of the, the Royal Navy is underway. Let's see what you guys say. Uh, Blue says the UK does get sunshine at least once a year. I hear it's going to be Thursday. Okay. Yeah. I tell you what, I've been to, I've been to the UK. Uh, actually, whenever I went in July, um, that time of year, it was actually kind of nice. It was a little bit warm actually. So yeah, I'm sure you guys don't, it's not as gloomy as you guys make it out to be over there. All right, let's talk about something a little more serious than Fleet Tracker, although Fleet Tracker is a lot of fun. And I love saluting the troops as they are deployed. But let's talk about North Korea for a minute because they've made a claim here that 
has really no credibility other than this photo that they've uh, provided as proof of their hypersonic missile. This is a hypersonic glide vehicle on top of a ballistic missile. So this Taipong variant of a ballistic missile has enough fuel and energy to push whatever's on the nose to incredible speeds. And they put what appears to be a hypersonic glide vehicle, and it's what they claim it to be as well, on the nose, saying that it uh, operated successfully and then you know went into the sea somewhere, which we'll probably read in the piece here. So um, North Korea is now claiming to have hypersonic weapons. Whether or not this thing can be aimed and hit anything, uh, whether or not it even works, is still questionable. I highly suspect that we tracked this ballistic missile launch as we do track all of the ballistic missile launches. And we know, as in the military knows, if this thing broke up in flight or not, which is what I suspect happened. Um, or maybe it works. Either way, we know that answer. It's just not public. But let's read from the piece in the war zone written by Joseph uh, Terevthik. I really struggled with his last name, Terevthik. Uh, Joseph writes, North Korean claims to have fired a new ballistic missile carrying a detached hypersonic glide warhead. The regime in Pyongyang has so far released just one picture uh, seen at the top of the story for this weapon. Again, that one right there. It's called the Hossong 8. Uh, making independent assessment is difficult. However, this test launch comes amid growing missile race between North Korea and South Korea, with both countries having unveiled a host of new designs this week. That's right. If you remember on Monday, we talked about the new high, uh, supersonic uh, anti-ship cruise missile and a ballistic missile submarine that is conventionally powered. Uh, South Korea has one of those now, which is great. Really good capability for them. All right. The missile, which North Korean state media describes as strategic in terms typically used for n nuclear armed weapons, was fired from a Myopyong Ri Rai in uh, North Korea. Uh, early Tuesday morning local time, the test came right after Kim Sung, North Korea's ambassador to the United Nations, made his speech at the annual UN General Assembly gathering uh, at the organization headquarters in New York City, where he declared his country's righteous right to conduct such launches. Okay. I suppose there's nothing wrong with doing the launches. Uh, South Korea's Yan Yat Hap news agency had already reported that there could be indications that the weapon uh, that the North had tested was a, of novel design and might include some sort of maneuverable re-entry vehicle. Sources in Seoul said the missile flew shorter than 200 kilometers, approximately 124 miles, at an altitude of around 60 kilometers, approximately 37 miles. Add, adding it showed different flight features from uh, the missiles North previously tested. Uh, at the time of the launch, one of the South Korean Air Force E-737 PSI airborne early warning radar control aircraft was flying uh, in orbit over the central part of the country. These aircraft have very capable multi-role active electronically scanned array radars, which have tracked the missile's flight and potentially gathered telemetry data, which is what I was telling you. We probably have this information. I'm just sure they're not, not going to share it, whether or not the test was successful. Uh, a single picture of the North Korean was released so far of the Hawksong 8 shows it only in silhouette, which it does have a very large and distinct nose section with fins, suggesting some sort of maneuverability and capability. That, it can also suggest stability, because whenever you go at those speeds, you know, you're going to need some way of keeping the nose straight. So it doesn't necessarily mean maneuverability. It could just be stability, uh, which would make it essentially a reentry vehicle. Yeah. Uh, attempts by experts and, uh, and observers to, manip to manipulate the image to try and determine the exact structure of the payload section have produced inconclusive results. There's also a possibility that the original North Korean image may be fabricated, too. That's true. They often doctor their own images. Uh, but there's a, there's a close-up of it. You can see the fins that they um, point out. Now, it's very easy to take a photo and put it into Photoshop and see if it's fake or not. Um, so I'm going with that this is probably real or else they, they would mention that. But also, if a, if a photo is doctored, that's also not always as obvious if it's done well. Oh, look at this. This is adorable. They have a little thing of it here. Let's zoom in on that. Oh, this is that looks animated. Is that real? These are mock-ups. Yeah, okay. This is not real. <laughs> I mean, it may be a real photo, but this is not a real missile. Uh, this is a mock-up of Chinese DF-17 on parade. So this is what it would look like after they build it. Yeah. 
Okay, the unpowered boost glide vehicles in general use a rocket boost to get them to optimal altitude and speed, after which the glider detaches and sails down towards its target at hypersonic speeds, um, defined as anything above Mach 5. These types of vehicles uh, follow an atmospheric flight trajectory to their target and are typically characterized by a high degree of maneuverability. Uh, the combination of speed, maneuverability, and flight path make them extremely challenging targets for the air defense networks to track and intercept compared to tr traditional ballistic missiles. Okay, so here's a great example of a ballistic missile flight path, which is parabolic, um, versus a hypersonic glide vehicle that can maneuver and still hit the same target versus a cruise missile. See how even a cruise missile... now. This is really simplified for a cruise missile. A cruise missile can maneuver as well, and they do maneuver. They can change every, all azimuths, just like a plane does. Uh, but it doesn't compare in speed to the hypersonic glide vehicles. Oh, this is as hypersonic here too, okay. Yeah, the, the these hypersonic cruise missiles, um, I'm pretty sure they can maneuver as well. Yeah, I know the supersonic ones do. Oh, here we go. This is from, uh, looks like North Korea here. I can't read the text, but that's this is what they expect. This could be altitude changes here. Hmm. Very interesting. So what do you guys think? Is this real? Or, I mean, obviously it's a real launch. This is a real photo. I think everybody agrees on that. But do, do they have this capability? Let's see what you guys say. Sailor says, you need to remember that this is the country that tried to convince people that Kim Jong-il uh, could control the weather based on his mood. Yes. Yeah, the, the culture of North Korea is fanatical and extreme by any comparison compared to any other country including china it is a realm unto its own it's like it's like oz it is very strange and alien to the rest of us but it is their culture and that's that's what they go with and so but what he means is that there is literally no credibility for anything that comes out of north korea and i would also agree with that john says it's probably a bottle of diet coke and mentos heavily photoshopped yeah I would love to get the original photo, like the raw file, and look at it, but I'm sure that's not available. There's no way they're releasing that, because then you can put it in Photoshop and see it pixel by pixel if they had made any changes. Yeah. You think it's China helped them and modified it themselves? That's possible. I mean, they do get a lot of help from China. Uh, recently, like in the past, I'll say 15 years, maybe, maybe about 15 years, uh, re relations between North Korea and China have chilled a little bit. They're not as warm as they used to be. They still have good relationships and they're probably better than any other country, China, North Carolina, North, North Korea, I almost said Carolina. Um, but they're not as good as they used to be. And that's because North Korea really wants to be independent of even China. Uh, they just don't have the resources to do it. Uh, and they're really mismanaged, obviously. Yeah. Armathon says, I, I think they're well aware of the hypersonic missile threat and want to make people think that they have them too. Yeah, just like they have the nuclear weapon capability, that's really what kept uh, the Kim Jong family in, in power this long. The reason why we haven't flipped this country like we did Libya, Syria, Iraq twice, you know, and Afghanistan. The reason why we haven't done that same thing to North Korea is because they have nuclear weapons and the ability to launch them ballistically at Japan and South Korea. Korea. Uh, so in that sense, it worked for them or else they would be, have to they would have been toppled by now. I think, uh, the awesomeness says it looks like an older version of the Russian Sam's. That's true. The SA two looks similar to this and maybe other SA weapons. But the first thing I thought of was SA two, cause it's a very uh, long range, high altitude and also very old, <laughs> uh, Sam system. 